Ruth chapter number one, if you got your Bible today, we're going to be reading from the very first chapter of Ruth. When you find your place, I invite you to stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. I'm actually going to back up and read the last verse of the book of Judges, which is directly in front of the book of Ruth, and you'll see why in just a minute, I, I believe. But the two, the two books correlate. They do correspond with each other. They're you can't really read one without knowing about the other uh, because if you do, you don't understand. A lot of people don't understand about the time when the judges ruled, but I can sum it up for you in Judges 21 and 25 and then in the first six verses of the book of Ruth. The Bible said, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In Ruth 1 and 1, that came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Kilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord has vi had visited his people in giving them bread. Brother Chris, would you lead us in prayer? Amen. Thank you, Brother Chris. Thank you for standing this morning. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today on uh, introductions and whatnot. I had a whole outline uh, prepared today. I'll be honest with you. The Lord, 86th day at about 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon and started kind of revealing something else to me. This morning, I didn't think I was going to use it until just a few minutes ago. Uh, this morning... The Lord showed me something else, and I didn't understand it, so I made a phone call. I got no help, really, in the phone call. Uh, sometimes it don't pay to ask somebody else. You're just going to do it yourself. So I opened up my, my Bible app, started studying a little bit in the coffee shop, and lo and behold, the very first thing I clicked on answered the question, and I learned something new this morning. And you, you might say, man, that's a... Uh, that's pretty crazy for somebody to say, you know, you, you learn something new. I've been studying the Bible pretty religiously now for 20 years. I think that's something to use the word religiously in the church. But anyway, uh, but I've been studying it pretty regularly for 20 years. And there's been spans of time in there where I spend a lot more time on it and spans of time where I spend a little less time on it. But it evens out to be about the same. And I'd, uh, I'd venture to say that over a day's time, just the here and there places where, I'm, where I stop and I take breaks or I'm just kind of sitting around and thinking about stuff, the, the stuff that I go and study on, I probably put five to six hours a day when it's all said and done. That's early in the morning, that's late at night when I can't sleep sometimes and I'm, I'm laying in the bed and I'm studying, I'm reading, I'm flipping through things. Uh, that's Bible study during the day, time spent just reading. I am not a reader. I'm not telling you not to read your Bible. But what I'm telling you is I am not a reader. I'm not the guy that can just sit down and start in Genesis 1 and read all the way through. I am a studier. That's my reading the Bible. I study while I read. 
and I get that's how I learn. I don't absorb information by just reading through it. My comprehension level is real low. I probably got some kind of disorder that I should have been treated with from with medicine, or maybe I should have had a few more stripes with a belt. I don't know. But anyway, I had a hard time paying attention as a child, and I still have a hard time paying attention. If you don't believe that, ask Miss Doan. She'll verify those are facts. I don't listen good. And this is exactly where we find Israel in the time when the judges rule. They don't listen good. The Bible said in that last verse of the book of Judges that in those days there were no kings. There was not an earthly ruler, per se, for Israel. And every man did that that was right in his own eyes. What a dangerous place and time that it was, and what a dangerous place and time that it is when we can decide what's right and what's wrong according to what we think. If you are a Christian, let me tell you this very plainly this morning. If you are a Christian, this is the final authority. Not what I think and not what you think. What the Bible says, that's, that's, that draws the line in the sand for a child of God. If you're going to believe, then you must believe this. If you don't believe this, then you can't believe in him. If you don't trust his word, then you can't trust him. It's just as simple as that. It's like saying you believe that in oxygen, but you don't believe that, that lungs is what helps you get breath. I mean, you, you can't have one without the other. Those days were filled with days just riddled with a span of time of people who did not believe or trust or heed to the word of God that had already been laid out before them. God had already tried in the book of Judges. God had already tried this great idea of letting people rule themselves. And it was an utter disaster. Can I tell you this morning that that's still a disaster? America's living proof of that. Man, we've taken the, we've taken the truth and we've, we've just cast it out and everybody's decided this is what's right and I'm right and you're wrong and we don't have debates and discussions anymore. We have screaming contests. And we want to, and we want to be right at all costs. So as long as I'm right, doesn't matter how many feelings I hurt, doesn't matter how many relationships that I destroy, doesn't matter who I offend at the God for the gospel's sake and drive away from the gospel. It doesn't matter that, that, that as long as I'm right. And unfortunately, that 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 way of thinking has made its way into the churches. So you had a whole generation now of this, and people have left the churches, and now they're out there trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong in a world where everybody just does whatever they think's right. And we, we rely on common sense to get us by, and most of us don't have common sense anymore. It, that's, a, that's literally a thing of the past. We think common sense is just every man's gift. Well, let me tell you how you learn common sense. You learn common sense by having your rear end wore out. You learn common sense by being accountable, by being held responsible for what you do. When I was growing up, this is how I learned common sense. Boy, get over there and grab that bale of hay and throw it up on that trailer. Uh, whack, 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 whack. About 40 licks later, after they done walked me around the trailer, I didn't get second chances. I didn't get told 45 times to do the same thing. I got told one time, and by the grace of God, I'd get a second warning. And God bless your pitiful soul. And my granny had to tell you three times. And, and she's here this morning. She, Grandpa didn't let us get away with but one time. You got one warning. That's about all you got. It's just the way it was. Tell a funny story on me. I was a little kid. <clears throat> I, wanted, uh, I wanted some crayons. And, and I liked for them to be sharpened a certain way. I believe that's right, ain't it, Granny? I, I wanted it sharpened a certain way. Grandpa sharpened it for me. And that wasn't just exactly the way I wanted it sharpened. And I dug it into the coffee table because I didn't like the way he did it. Whew. I ran and jumped in my mama's arms looking for protection. 
And my mama said, I knew if I held on to you, he was going to whoop me too. <laughs> Out in the floor I went. That's how I learned how to have common sense. You learn the hard way a lot of times how not to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And you figure out, you know, I might ought to think some of this through before I do it. Elimelech, whose name literally means my God is king, decided because there was a famine in the land, and, and understand this, the reason there was a famine in the land is what we've already talked about, because people were trying to do what was right in their own eyes and not doing things God's way. There will always be a famine in the land. One place it says it's not a famine, not of bread, not of water, but it's going to be a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. And that's exactly where many of us find ourselves today. And that's exactly what's wrong in our world is there is a famine of hearing of the Word of God. It's not because it's not available. It's because we're not listening to the Word of God. We are not hearing what God has said. Therefore, we find ourselves in a desperate place, in desperate times, pulling out des all the stops, desperate measures, trying to figure out what God wants for us, how God wants us to go about it, to do things God's way in this day and age is not an easy task. And it's because there's a famine of hearing. We're not taught to hear or to listen to. And let me tell you this. I've said this a whole bunch. It's okay for God to say something to you and you say, Lord, is that really you? It is okay for you to lay a fleece out before the Lord like Gideon did and decide and make sure that that's exactly what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, and the way that you're supposed to be doing it. It's okay to try the Spirit. Matter of fact, the Bible said to try the spirits to see whether or not they be of God. You need to know for sure that it's God speaking to you before you do it. If at all possible, you need to know 100% without a doubt that it's God that's talking. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in a mess. So a famine arose in Israel in a time when everybody was just doing whatever they thought was right. And Elimelech, in the Israeli fashion of the day, decided that what was right for him and his family was to get up and leave Bethlehem, which, by the way, means the house of bread, to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab. Moab was just, it was a, it was a few, not, not by terms of modern day, it wasn't that far away, but it was a land that was prohibited for Hebrews, for Israeli people, Jewish people to go to. God's people weren't supposed to even be down there fooling around. Not for any reason. They're supposed to leave that stuff alone. But Moab had plenty to eat. Moab had plenty to drink. Moab had a good economy going on at the time. Moab had all the bells and all the whistles. Moab, Moab had it going on. Elimelech decided for him and his family the best thing they could do to survive was leave this place over here where things was a little barren and a little rough right now. And it was getting a little hard to exist and it was getting a little hard to, to, to hang on and go down there to a place where they have everything at their fingertips. So him and his wife Naomi, who, whose name means pleasantness, by the way, the pleasantness of God. God had been pleasant to her, treated her kindly. He leaves, he leaves with his wife and his two sons, Malon and Kilion. Malon, name, it means sick. Kilion's name means pining, which means that it's, he's basically in, in, a, in a state of failure. He's, in a, he's headed for destruction. He's coming, his life is coming to an end. From very early on, these two boys, they were, on the, they were on the low end of the stick. They always had, they were always looking at the end, facing the end as they was going through life, and they didn't live very long. We don't know how long they could have lived. What we do know is when Elimelech died, Instead of coming back to Bethlehem like they should have, they decided to get married in Moab. And when they got married in Moab, they violated a law. And there was no other Jewish people in Moab to, to, to uh, fulfill the punishment, which would have been killing them. They, they, they were supposed to be put to death. 
So God saw fit to, to take their life. They just died. I asked a question the other night, and I told you I wasn't going to use it in the sermon, but I might as well, ever since everything else is going wide open around here. I asked the question, why, if it was against the law for Malon and Kilion to marry, these, to marry Orpah and Ruth, then why, how come later on in the book of Ruth, Boaz gets away with it? Because, and, and there were several answers went out, some good solid answers too. In our mind, our, our common sense just tells us, so she left Moab and went to Bethlehem, and she said, my God will be, your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. So you would think that she, that she was right with the Lord. She became a Jew. That's not so. Because in those days, you could say, I am one of you, but unless they took you in and brought you in and accepted you as one of them, you were never going to be one of them. She was, and at this time, all the way through, all the way up until the end, until Boaz married her and made her his wife, then she became accepted. But up until that point, she was not considered to be one of God's people. So how did Boaz get away with it? Well, if you know anything about your Bible history, you know that Boaz had a mama and a daddy. His daddy was half Jewish. His mama was full Amorite. His mama was from a place called Jericho. And his mama was a lady whose name is famous, matter of fact, included in the Word of God in the Hall of Fame of Faith, and her name was Rahab. She was a harlot. She was married to a man named Salmon. In the history books, when I went studying here not too long ago, when I was studying for my doctorate, I ran across some information that said that after Salmon died, that it's widely believed to be the truth that Rahab ended up marrying Joshua and had a bunch of other sons who were very prominent, one of them being the prophet Jeremiah. And, and so you, you got this lineage, this double lineage inside a double lineage. So there were some things that happened. One, you see that the boys died, the, son, the, the dad died, then the boys died, and then you get to the place where Naomi's sitting here and she does not know what she's going to do. Let me just tell you something. If you venture out into Moab spiritually, here's what happens. The same thing that happened to them in Moab physically. It looks good when you get there, but over a span of time, the same thing you ran away from, you just ran into. Because if you ain't got trouble in your life now, you best bank on this. Trouble is headed your direction. You can't run away from one problem without facing it and expect to just not ever have to deal with it because eventually you're going to run into it again. Headlong, face to face, she ran into another famine. And that famine was, now I have no husband, I have no sons, and I'm stuck with two daughter-in-laws who, who don't, who don't, who, they're, they're both Moabitesses. And one of them was a Moabitess priest, priestess, they called her. And that was Ruth. Nobody was willing to accept them. I can't go home and I can't stay here. I don't know what I'm going to do. It seemed like she didn't have no hope at this point in time. And we know that she really didn't want to carry them with her because she tried several times to get them to stay. But I want to call your attention to something that happens in verse 6. And I'm going to preach just a few minutes and I'll be quiet. If you don't go to sleep on me, you might, you might learn a little something this morning. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to one behind you this morning. <laughs> Amen. I love it. I'll pay for that Thursday night. <laughs> verse 6 said, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people, in giving them bread. What's significant to that is the word visited means attended to. It looked after. I want to preach just a few minutes on this thought. What happens when God visits his people? you got to understand this comes from two perspectives. Number one, it comes from the perspective of those who left Bethlehem, who left the house of bread and ventured into a place what seemed like was good turned out to be worse. And then you got the perspective of those who never left the house of bread 
who never left Bethlehem when times got hard, who stayed in there, who fought the fight, who kept the faith, who battled it out and lasted and endured until the end. And then God visited them again and attended to their needs. He took care of them. So what happens when God visits his people? There's a few things that happen. Number one, from the perspective of somebody who's away from the fold and away from the faith and living contrary to the word and the will of God, the first thing God does when he visits his people is he lets you hear about it. What I always love is all through the scriptures, whenever some, Jesus was doing something great all through the New Testament, any time that something was going on, people heard round about. Somebody was telling it, people was telling it, everybody was talking about it, they just couldn't keep it quiet. And, Jesus, and, and the, these, big, these huge crowds would show up because it was noised abroad or because it was told through the town or because somebody went and walked uh, through the community saying, come see a man who told me all things ever I did. There was always somebody spreading the word about what God was doing because that's just the way God does things. He uses people to deliver his message that I have visited my people. I have visited that person. I have made a difference in their lives. I have attended to his or her needs. I have uh, came down and communed with them. My presence went before them, and God did marvelous things. Boy, I got them on me five deep this morning. I don't know about y'all, but I love the fact that God always tells me when he's doing something somewhere else. And I rejoice in the fact that God's doing something in other places. I'm happy about what God's doing here, but when other preachers call me and say, man, let me tell you what the Lord did today, I rejoice in that too because I'm glad God's still doing things in other places. I'm not one of these that believes God can only move here. God can move whenever, to where, wherever and however to whoever he chooses to move. And I love when God does things other places. But when God ain't doing it for me, that gives me hope that God's doing it for somebody. That means God is still visiting his people. And then she heard about it way down in Moab, which means somebody passed by and said, man, I heard that God had blessed that place where you came from again. I heard the famine's over in Bethlehem. I heard he's been giving them bread up there. See, there's a thing about the, I, 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 don't, I don't know a lot about farming. Bill can tell you a whole lot more about that, but we ain't got time to listen to his lecture about it this morning. But I can tell you this. Best I can tell in the old days, they, they really relied on the first rain and the latter rain. They called it the early rain and the latter rain. The early rain would help them make sure everything was in the ground good, and the latter rain was a signal that it was time to reap the harvest. Everything, that it growed properly, and they got watered one good last time, and they was ready to be harvested. And if they didn't get both of them, then their crops were off for that year. They might get a little bit, they might get nothing. So the farmers of those days depended on that first rain and the latter. So when the Bible speaks about these things and people teach about them and Jesus talks about it and the prophets use it, it's, you need to understand that what he's talking about here is their livelihood. Without it, they don't eat. They didn't have the things that they couldn't just run down to food land or or Publix and, or Walmart and buy whatever they needed. I mean, I go, I don't know about, I go frequently to the Walmart deli and they look at me crazy when I go in there because big as I am and, I'm, and I usually ask for these same two or three things. I want mac and cheese and I want mashed potatoes with no gravy. Number one, because they don't sell fried taters. I'm not a fan of the wedges. But if they sold fried taters like Granny cooked them, glory to God. I'd order them by the bucket. I mean, I'd be walking out of there like this. Probably broke. Sometimes I'll get chicken fangs if I'm feeling industrious or extra hungry. But in those days, they didn't have that. They couldn't just run down to the grocery store and get whatever. They had to depend on what they got from the fields to survive. And if they didn't get the first rain, they didn't get the latter rain, and that would, that would bring on a famine. They might could make it one or two years, depending on what they had in stores, storage, but they weren't going to last very long. They was going to start starving to death. And ain't it something when God visits his people, other people begin to hear about it? There was no reason for the Moabites to hear what was going on in Bethlehem except for what God must have been doing in Bethlehem was so great and so abundant Things were going so well, and we know that, that it was going real good because when they got back to Bethlehem, 
I mean, things were booming. People had then took over their spread. They had to reclaim everything. Naomi had to go through a process, and Ruth, bless her heart, had to endure all kind of hardship because Naomi couldn't work like Ruth. So Ruth had to go out and try to make ends meet for them, and she was just surviving on the scraps and the leftovers and the handfuls on purpose. But God lives in the handfuls on purpose. How you know that, preacher? Because I have had to live in his handfuls on purpose. And it don't seem like much when he goes to dishing them out, but little is much when God gets in it. And somehow or another, we have always survived because David said it this way, I, have, I was once young and now I'm old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. God will make sure that you hear about it. But the second thing God does when he visits his people is he helps them. And he helped them by giving them bread again. And we're not really told if it comes by the way of crops or maybe he did like he did earlier in the Old Testament and made manna fall from the heavens. Maybe that's how they got bread. I don't know, but I know this. God gave them bread. God met their greatest need, and that was not to starve to death. That was to have something to get them by, and it and, and wasn't just bread. He gave them barley. That means they, there was a lot of other things that they could do. I mean, the fields were rich, and the, and the farms were producing again, and God's people were prospering again. A lot of things were happening. God will always help you when he visits you. You will not come out of a visitation from God worse off than you went into it. You will always become better for it when God visits you. Now, that visit may be difficult. That visit may be hard. It may involve cutting some things loose or striping you or mashing your toes. I, I, don't, I don't know about the rest of you, but that happens to me pretty regular. But I can tell you this. Anytime God sits down in my chair with me, anytime God stands up next to me and begins to move around in my mind and my heart and my spirit, I always leave that better off than I entered in. That's just the way God does things. The third thing, which is the best thing that God does when he visits his people, is he restores hope. Because people, when everybody heard about it, the help he was giving them restored their hope in him. And they began to praise him again. And they began to worship him again. And they turned from their wicked ways and turned back to God because of what God was doing. God was revealing himself. In other words... When, when just about the time they thought God wouldn't do it again, God said, let me do that one more time for you. Yeah. Well, God, I've done this, and I've turned from you 15 times already, and, and you've showed up 14 times, and, 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 and I just don't know if you'll do it again. God said, let me show up one more time. I don't just serve the God of a second chance or a third chance. I serve a God of the next chance this morning. And I'm glad for the next chances that I had because it gives me hope for the day, hope for tomorrow, hope for next week and next year, hope for all eternity because my hope is not in somebody walking around on the planet. My hope this morning lies in the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope is already seated at the right hand of God making intercession for all who would believe. Uh, my hope this morning is the fact that just like Ruth, my hope came from an unexpected place. My hope came from somewhere that they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? My hope uh, came, amen, down from heaven. And my hope didn't live in a mansion. My hope was born and laid in a manger. Uh, my hope didn't uh, be raised up in royalty. My hope was raised up in a carpenter's house. My hope, amen, was not in the law and tradition and religious isms and schism. My hope, amen, stood up and boldly proclaimed before Abraham was. I am and if you knew who he was you'd know who I am but you didn't listen to Moses and you didn't listen to the prophet Isaiah and you didn't listen to Jeremiah you didn't listen to the little prophets they all spoke about me but you didn't read the book so you don't know who I am if you'd read the book you'd know me and as Jesus was getting ready to start his ministry or to start his ascension he crossed over that mountain from Bethlehem going into Jerusalem and he stopped and he wept over Jerusalem. You know why? Because they did not know the hour of their visitation. They did not know or realize that God 
was visiting them. And they killed him. But in fulfilling all the prophecy, in fulfilling the work, in fulfilling his duty, in fulfilling his calling, in fulfilling the law, he took on our sin. Apostle Paul said, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. We became, we became free. He took on the likeness of man, and then he took on our sin so that we could be free and saved from all eternity or from, all, from, from being separated from God for all eternity. I don't know about everybody else this morning. I just know about me. And I'm very thankful that no matter what happens and no matter what goes on in my life, that my hope is not in people. My hope is not even in myself. My hope is in Jesus this morning. Amen. The farther away from Bethlehem I got, the worse life got from me. The Bible said that they was from Bethlehem, Judah. But they were Ephrathites. In the, in the book of Micah, I believe it's chapter 5, verse number 1, where he talks about the Lord, he prophesies the Lord's coming. He would, be, he would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And, 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 and so I called a doc this morning and I said, is there, is there a reason that both of those, that Bethlehem's elongated twice with two different names? Once is Bethlehem Judah, the other is Bethlehem Ephrathah. Is there a difference? And he said, yes, but I can't remember what it is. I got a message out there somewhere about it that I preached a long time ago, told me what it was. I didn't have time to go listen to it. If you know how Doc preaches, I've been out there for an hour and 20 minutes, and y'all have already been through. So I get, on, I get on my little study app, and I look, and the very first thing I clicked on, boom, there it was. Ephrathah. House of bread, we already determined, means is, is what Bethlehem means. It means house of bread. So that leaves us with the other two words. What's important about Judah and Ephrathah? Well, when Bethlehem, when Judah is attached to Bethlehem, it means a house of bread and it attaches worship and praise to it. When Ephrathah is attached to Bethlehem, it, it literally means fruitful. Multiplication. It's a place of fruitfulness in the house of bread. When, isn't it funny that when when it's used in terms of that they were just Ephrathites, when you, when you just say Ephrath and attach ites to it, guess what that means? It means an ash heap. That's what Ephrath means. So without having Bethlehem attached to it, it's just simply the word Ephrath with the ites added to it, which means they were people of an ash heap. That's what going to Moab and leaving behind the house of bread, and leaving behind your praise, and leaving behind your worship, that's what it'll get you. It'll get you an ash heap. But if you will do what God says do, and you return home, you can find what the prophet Micah found when he's talking to prophet Simon about the Lord's coming. It'll be, it'll be Bethlehem, Ephrathah. The house of God won't just be a, play, a place of praise and worship anymore. The house of God will become a place where you can be fruitful. And multiply, which was exactly what God told man to do from the very beginning. And it's exactly what God's telling us to do even right now. If you return to the Lord, if you return. Now, Bethlehem was a place. It was a city. It was a spot of land. And spiritually speaking this morning, a spot of land ain't going to do you. Ain't One spot of land ain't no better than another spot of land. But I can tell you this. Spiritually speaking, there's a spot of land in your heart that he's supposed to be sitting on the throne of. And if he's sitting on the throne of your heart, it'd do you good to return to that spot of land and worship him and praise him and start doing what he said and be fruitful and multiply. If you ever, ever going to experience the blessing of God, if you truly want to experience the grace of God, you're going to have to get out of Moab and get back where you belong.
Caleb, come on, help me if you can. I hate to have you put your baby down. Bless his heart. He just got quiet. This morning, if you're here and you're living in Moab and the Lord is calling you out, I'm begging you with all that's in me, leave Moab behind once and for all and return to the house of bread. Leave behind that place. Leave, leave, come on, Dylan. Leave behind that place where there's no fruitfulness. Leave behind that ash heap that you've made out of life. Leave behind the ash heap, ash heap that life's made out of you. You can leave that behind and you can return home to Bethlehem. I don't know where anybody's at in this room this morning except for me. Truly, 100%, I know where I'm at and that's it. But if you're here and you don't know the Lord, it's time to get out of the ash heap and come home. If you're here and you've moved out into Moab, it's time to get out of the ash heap and come home. If you're here and you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired, it's time to come home. Because the Lord has visited his people. to his people. Look around this room. Tell me God ain't attending to his people. Tell me God ain't visiting his people. And even when times are hard, the faith and the courage that people stand so firm with and face all the challenges that life is dishing out. It's a testament that God has visited their life. If you can look death in the eye and unashamedly say, I'm not afraid, and even if this even if this ends my life here, it just it is not a it, it's not a burden, it's not a it, it's not a punishment for a Christian to go to heaven. When you can embrace that, truly understand that God is visiting you with a purpose and for a reason that's to give you hope and peace that passes all understanding. Joy that people can't even describe and comprehend. That's what Jesus does. If you're here this morning, and that's you. I'm going to get them sang just a minute. But if you're here this morning, that's you. This is your time to respond. The choice is yours. Choose wisely. Every head bowed. That's the message. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to pray. Father, we thank you for each and every one that's come this way today. I pray, Lord, if I said it did anything, God, out of the way this morning, you reveal that to me, that I might repent of that and never speak of it or do it again. God, I thank you for attentive ears and hearts this morning. And I pray you speak to each and every one in a mighty and a powerful way. Do the work in this place, God, that only you can do. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings of life. Thank you for what you're doing here in this time in our generation for still visiting us visiting all your people. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Go with us now in the time of invitation, Lord. We'll be careful to thank you. Give you the honor and glory for it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet if you would. If you're here this morning, you need a touch from heaven, I pray that you, you just allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. And if he's nudging you, urging you to get out of Moab, don't even think about it. Turn your back and leave Moab behind. The story goes on about Ruth and Orpah and the Bible said that Ruth she clave to Naomi. She wouldn't let her go. But Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and went back. Now Orpah's name has two meanings and they both apply. One means a gazelle which is a runner. One, and the other name that means like a mane or something that you see on the back of her neck because that's all you could see as she was walking away going back to Moab was the hair on the back of her neck. See, in life, I found out there's two, two different types of people in times like this. There's cleavers and there's leavers. And 
that's the decision you got to make today. Are you a cleaver? Or are you a leaver? Get out of my way. I learned early on about the joys of living right. I was there on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night. I was tempted as a young man. I made no excuse for the lipstick on my collar and the sawdust. On my boots. I slipped off the straight and narrow, took a turn for the worst. Still, I quote you any scripture, any chapter, in any verse. It's been too many years to know now, since I'm dark in the door. Now I'm asking for forgiveness I can't live this way no more I'm down on my knees Heart is willing but the mind is weak Grace I've been praying hard and pleading with the one who paid the cost. My burdens I'll be leaving at the foot of the cross. The more that I am taking aim at the straight and narrow way. But my eyes are on the future Going forward from this day By faith and all the works I know Lest any man should boast Can a sinner find salvation Through the one who suffered most I'm down is willing but the mind is weak grace amazing is what i need broken scared and alone i've been praying hard and pleading with the one who paid the cost my burdens I'll be leaving at the foot of the cross. If you need to come, there's still time this morning. You won't be by yourself. You can see there'll be people that'll meet you in the altar that'd love to help you lead you right up to the throne of grace this morning. Amazing grace ain't just for everybody else, it's for you too. And no matter where you're coming from, what part of Moab you've been living in, or what kind of ash pile you found yourself in, if you just come, His grace will be sufficient for you. the straight and narrow way but my eyes are all the future going forward from this day by faith and all the works I know lest any man should boast can a sinner find salvation through the one who suffered most I Scared.
I've been praying hard and please With the one who paid the cost My burdens I'll be leaving At the foot of the cross I've been praying hard and pleased With the one who paid the cost My burdens I'll be leaving At the foot of the cross Of all the things I ever went through in life The worst things turned out to be the best thing. Because the worst thing will make you to bring out the best in you. Or it'll just continue the worst in you. If you truly want to change, if you truly want to see God do something in your life, you got to be willing to get out on your knees and lay it all down at the foot of the cross. Get up. Turn your back on it and just walk away. Don't turn around and grab it. Don't turn around and look for it. Don't turn around and ask God to send you some way to deal with it. Just ask God to take it, to handle it, to help you. One thing I know about God, he don't just, he don't just leave it in your hand when he takes it. He does, he does away with it. The Bible says what God does, he does forever. But when God handles it, that settles it. When God says it, that's the end of it. When God does it, it's done. And at the cross, when Jesus looked toward heaven and said, it is finished, then he bowed his head he gave up the ghost. He laid down his own life so that you and I could go free. There's still time for you if you need to come. I'm begging you. I can't, I can't for the life, I can't say enough good, I can't put, I can't put it into words this morning. I don't have enough eloquent words to say to adequately describe the work of God in my life. And you won't be able to either. All you can really just say is it's good. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. If you need to come while they sing, won't you come? I'm begging you, won't you come?
matter what life brings, he's still been a good God. If he don't ever do anything else, he's still been a good God. And someday I have standing in front of a firing line or an execution chamber. My faith has still been a good God. No matter what, he's good. I love you this morning. Thank you so much for being here. There's one announcement I need to make. September the 2nd, they're doing a yard sale here. Raise money for our building fund. I don't know what time exactly it's going to start, but 7 a.m. If you want to come early, come help them get some stuff sorted, separated. I know they appreciate it on that Friday before in the morning of. It'll be a good opportunity for those of us who ain't yard selling up and just minister to people as they come up. Give them a helping hand. Just be able to make talk, just talk to them. And not just invite them to church, but invite them to Jesus. And I would pray you consider doing that. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless.